Hello, I'm Julie Hutchinson and I am here with Charles McInerney talking about some very relevant topics for especially the people that are inside these groups, leaders and executives who may be facing some stress and some burnout. And I've invited Charles in here because Charles does a lot of corporate events. He does corporate events with team building and goal setting. He also is an incredible yoga teacher. I've actually had the honor and privilege of being in some of his yoga classes. He is a public speaker and he also does yoga teacher training and yoga writing retreats. And so Charles is here with us today to give some tips and ideas on how you can relieve some stress in the moment. We're also going to be talking about something that is near and dear to his heart, a book that he has just recently written called Toxic Goals, Flow, and the Pursuit of Excellence. And when we talked about this, it was so intriguing to me because so many of us in corporate America know about setting goals. And the way that Charles talks about this is very unique and very different. So I think a lot of people will get some aha moments today. So Charles, welcome. I'm really happy that you're here. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And so I'd love to just learn a little bit more about you and maybe how you got started in this pursuit of excellence and yoga and breath work. So if you could just let the audience know a little bit about you and how you came into this. Uh, well, I was living in uh, England. I grew up in England and uh, there was a lot of stress back in the 19 early 70s with Ireland and bombings in London and my mother and sister were taking yoga classes. And uh, I think it was during the coal miner strike when we were all sitting around by candlelight and there was no electricity and all the news was horrible. And uh, my mother decided to drag me to a yoga class uh, with her, uh, thinking that that would be helpful. And so when I was 11, I started practicing yoga and hated it. Uh, it was adult yoga classes back then. There wasn't kids yoga. And uh, for an 11 year old, it was torture, uh, being still and breathing. After the third class though, I started enjoying it. And then I found that the um, learning how to breathe correctly made me a better soccer player, uh, which in England was the key to success. And then in high school, I noticed that I performed better on tests because I didn't get anxious. I was able to stay calm and focus whether I knew the material or not. And so I saw very quickly that it helped me uh, as an athlete and it also helped me uh, in academics. And so that really, that double impact um, helped me to stay uh, in the practice. And so I've been practicing now for, I guess, 50 years. 50 uh, years, that, that's a long time. So you've yeah. seen the benefits of breath work throughout all sorts of things oh, yes. in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And of everything that yoga has taught me, the breathing is probably gives the greatest um, benefit for the least amount of effort. And so I thought that's where we could start uh, sharing some uh, very simple things that we can do uh, relating to breathing and stress. I think that would be fantastic. And the best part about it is it sounds like you can do it anytime, anywhere, no matter where oh, yes. you are. Yes. Yeah. So yes, let's take some, let's uh, walk, walk through some breath work right now. We'll take some time to do that. And those of that are, are watching this, I'm inviting you to just participate right along with us today. Yeah. So I thought we'd start with, um, I like to, in yoga, we believe in, uh, yoga considers itself a science, which my dad was a physicist and to him, physics was a science, chemistry grudgingly was a science. Um, but anything beyond that, he considered an art. Uh, he had degrees in sociology, history, philosophy, as well as uh, chemistry and physics. Uh, and he loved sociology and psychology, um, anthropology, but he said that they can't really call themselves sciences because they aren't able to control the variables, too complex. So he said they're more of an art form than a science. So when I heard that yoga was a science, I rolled my eyes, you know, my dad's voice picked up in my head, that can't be a science. Uh, but I was intrigued when I found out why it calls itself a science. In the West, the Western scientific model moves forward, consensus is built around two individual uh, laboratories or two individuals that aren't connected doing the same experiment and getting the same result. 
So when you get that confirmation, the entire uh, academic field buys in. So we don't all go out and repeat Michelson Morley's experiment to measure the speed of light. We just assume that that must be true because two different people say it is. So it allows Western science to move forward very, very quickly. Uh, it's an act of faith, faith in our fellow scientists. Uh, yoga has a slightly different twist. In yoga, they believe in verification through direct personal experience. So in yoga, it doesn't matter who says it, how important they are, how much you respect them. Everything you take in is an interesting theory. Then in your personal practice, you experiment with it. And if you verify it through direct personal experience, then for you, it becomes fact. And so what I'd like for um, our participants to do today isn't to memorize or to take anything on fact. What I'd like for them to do is actually uh, verify for themselves, um, almost as a scientist. Um, can we do some simple little quick things where you can see what is the impact of breathing? Uh, so we we'll start with a measurement of our breathing and then we'll do a little pranayama. Prana means breath, but it also means subtle energy like chi. Yama means control. So pranayama, the control of breath. We'll do maybe just a minute or two of pranayama and then we'll take a second measurement. And the question is, does a couple of minutes of deliberately breathing uh, of pranayama, does that change what is called our tidal breath? So I don't have a whole lot of interest in having students come into a yoga class once a week and breathe really, really well for 20 minutes or an hour once a week, because the other six days and 23 hours, if they're breathing poorly, I really haven't done that much to help them. What I'm really interested in, can we shift the unconscious breathing patterns? Can we do something that shifts our breathing patterns, our habits, our habitual breathing, where for the other six days and 23 hours, we're breathing better than we would have normally, okay? And so that's the at the heart of this next exercise. So there's, yes, go ahead. So just quick question, because people might be asking this to themselves yeah. right now is, is this something that I'm gonna to have to practice for a while before I can actually shift the subconscious breath? Uh, that's what we'll find out. Okay. The yogis say it happens almost immediately. Now you have to, you, um, uh, what they say is if you do just a couple minutes of deliberate breathing every day, you'll benefit throughout the entire day. So that's the question we wanted to see if we can verify for ourselves. So the measurement is going to be a practice called detached observation, which in itself is a form of meditation. So here we're going to breathe and we're going to let go of any control, any interference. In other words, we're going to let the body breathe the way it would breathe if we weren't paying attention. This is almost impossible to do. Uh, that's the bad news. Uh, if you imagine a mother wanting to, hearing to your daughter playing with her best friend upstairs, having a wonderful time, and mom decides to just observe them quietly. So she opens up the door ever so slightly, sticks her nose in. As soon as the kids know they're being watched, what happens? They start to change changes. their behavior. It's impossible to observe without changing. The same is true of our breath. The very moment you look at your own breathing, you're going to be interfering with it. The question is, how much are you interfering? Are you the parent that gives their kids a train set and then takes over and tells them, no, no, trains don't do that. This is how it does and absolutely micromanages. Or are you the parent sitting on the park bench pretending to read a magazine while out of a corner of your eye, at a great distance, you're observing your child in such a way that they don't feel like you're observing. So that's how we're going to watch the breath out of the corner of our eye from a great distance. And you'll breathe. And then at some point, I'm going to ask you to count. And we're going to count how many breaths do you take in 30 seconds. And then I'll ask you to remember that number. Okay. So let's start by closing our eyes. And as you pay attention, you may realize you are interfering. Just kind of relax through that. After a little bit, that'll pass. We're going to start counting how many breaths you take. Breathing in and out would be one, in and out would be two, starting now.
and stop. And then just remember that number. Now, if you double that number, we did that for 30 seconds. If you double it, that gives you breaths per minute. Okay. And if you need to write that down, just so you'll remember, you can write down whatever that number is. Double the number you counted to, breaths per minute. And so that is called your tidal breath. Uh, in hospitals, they'll measure your tidal volume. That's the amount of air you breathe in and out when you aren't interfering, when you're just watching TV. Uh, this is our tidal uh, rhythm the rhythm at which you breathe when you aren't interfering. Okay? So now we're gonna do a little pranayama. Uh, now, if you have a straw handy, you can use a straw. However, you can do this without a straw. I'm gonna demonstrate with the straw. And Julie, if you could demonstrate without it. Okay. Um, and the straw forces you to slow down your exhale. I'm gonna breathe in through the nose and then I'll breathe out through the straw, in through the nose, out through the straw. The straw, all it's really doing though, is making me slow my breath down. So my breath is about the exhales twice as long. So you can do this without the straw, just breathe in and then breathe out twice as long. Breathe in slowly, breathe out twice as long. We'll do this just for a minute or two. Close your eyes, sit up tall, open the chest, and then breathing in through the nose and out through the straw if you have one, and if not, just breathing out slowly. Try to improve your posture so that breathing becomes more free. If you try to sit up too tall, you can't breathe well, and if you slump, you can't breathe well, but if you find that space right in between sitting too tall and slumping where the breath feels most free and clean and easy, Four or five more breaths. Breathing in through the nose, out through your straw. Couple more breaths. One more breath. Then opening your eyes and just setting the straw aside. Okay, uh, so that was a little less than two minutes of deliberately slowing down and improving the quality of our breathing. So the question is, does that affect our tidal breath? The way we breathe when we're no longer thinking about it. So we'll do one more measurement now. Close your eyes and pay attention without interfering. Start counting now. and stop, okay? And then just make note of that and then double that number. So the question is, were the two numbers the same or was the second number smaller? The second number was smaller. About 50%? 50%, exactly 50%. And that's what I find with about 95% of my students, uh, they'll see about um, that they're breathing about twice as fast as they were. And so the point of this exercise was that if you deliberately consciously interfere with your breathing, but in a good way, to improve the quality of your breathing for just a few minutes, you get lasting effects that can follow you through the rest of the day. Uh, some of the yogis, um, especially the ones, you know, the classical Indian yogis, uh, a lot of them will get up at four in the morning and they'll do an hour, sometimes two hours of pranayama uh, before they even leave their bedroom. And then they say they benefit from that for the rest of the day. And I'm not one of those yogis, uh, but I do a few minutes every morning before I get out of bed. I may do two, three minutes, sometimes half an hour 
of breathing, but at least two or three minutes of deliberate conscious breathing before I even get out of bed. And then throughout the day, uh, anytime I think about it, standing in line in the elevator, stuck at a red light, these are all opportunities just to do a little pranayama and uh, priming the pump. And what I find is that if I do that two or three times a day, I breathe really well throughout the entire day. So I get the uh, 24 hours of benefit from just a couple of minutes of deliberate conscious practice. And can you talk a little bit more about the benefits that you're getting from yes. this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, let's talk about specifically um, stress and fight flight. So there's some studies that show that when our tidal uh, rhythm is above 16, that's 16 breaths per minute. So you, when you doubled your number, whatever number that was, when it is over 16, that's associated with a fight flight response with stress and anxiety. And it also uh, has an effect on decision-making. And I'll come back to that. When it's below eight, that's associated with relaxation and calmness and creativity and uh, better decision-making skills. And then in between is a kind of a gray area. So our target is getting uh, our tidal rhythm, the rhythm when we, and we're talking about not when we're controlling it, but when you let go of control and your body takes over is your body breathing fast or slow. And when it's breathing below eight breaths per minute, we tend to be make much better decisions. Okay. Um, is there so, even a greater benefit the lower that we get it? Do we see yes. exponential benefits? Uh, yes. Um, and benefits are kind of a, um, they're, they're reasons to breathe fast. They're really good reasons to breathe fast, like if you're being chased by a tiger. So I don't want to say, you know, when we say benefits, it depends on your environment. But for a typical environment where you aren't being chased by a tiger, the slower rhythm of breathing is going to be much better than a fast rhythm. Um, it kind of makes sense if you think about it a little bit. We have two different, completely separate, independent networks in our brain for making decisions. Okay. One is at the reptilian level. And it is blindingly fast. It's a reactive network. And it can take in a lot of information and come to an instant snap decision and react. And so it's a reactive network and it works so fast that it can save your life. It's almost a reflex. You step out in traffic, a car honks and you jump back. You don't think about what's behind you, what's in front of you. You don't think about what people will think. There's no time to think, so you don't, you react. Okay. When our breathing gets up, uh, over about 14 breaths per minute, that network takes over in decision-making. Okay? And the reason is when we're over 14 breaths per second, our body and our nervous system um, assumes that there must be a crisis. An 14 breaths per crisis. minute, not second, per minute. Yes, yeah, so 14 okay. breaths per minute, um, okay. our body starts getting very reactive and jumpy and uh, jittery. And so we start making impulsive decisions. This is one reason um, at a used car lot, uh, they don't want you to be relaxed because wow. then you use a completely different circuit, uh, pause and reflect. You put off making a decision, you gather information, you weigh it, you balance it, and then you come to an informed decision. Uh, a used car salesman doesn't want you using that circuitry. They want you using the reactive circuitry. So they keep you off balance a little bit. Now, if you're too scared, you shut down, you freeze up. But if you're just slightly anxious and your breathing speeds up a little bit, then you tend to be much more reactive in decision-making. Uh, and then driving home, Oh, yeah, and when you say, let me sleep on it, they panic because they know what's going to happen. Driving home, you relax, you're comfortable, you're in your own space again, and you begin to breathe slower. And then you realize that you've got two kids that want to go to college and maybe the Porsche isn't the best move right now. And so you take in the information, come to a much better decision. So one piece of advice is never make a decision. Well, if it's a crisis where there is no time, then you have to react. You go with your gut feeling. Um, there's no time to think it through. Then you make a snap reaction and then trust it. Uh, but if you have the luxury of not having to make a snap decision, then what they recommend is you practice just a little bit of breathing until your tidal breath. So when you let go of control, if your body speeds right back up, you aren't there yet. You have to get it where when you let go of control, your body on its own continues breathing slowly. And when your body continues to breathe slowly on its own, 
anything below eight breaths per minute, then you're gonna be in a much better place for making a, an important decision. Uh, so if you keep a little straw in your purse or in your back pocket and the used car salesman asks you to sign on the dotted line, just tell him to give you five minutes and run to the restroom and breathe out of your straw. Yeah. And just slow your breathing down. Okay. I'll model bad breathing and I'm going to exaggerate and then I'll model good breathing and I'll make some noise so you can hear. I'll move my hand up and down to signal whether I'm breathing in or out. And I want you intuitively to sense what's happening to my heart rate, my blood pressure, and my state of mind. Okay, so I'll start with bad breathing. And basically it's no pattern at all. Stopping, starting, abrupt, jerky. Okay. And you can and then, see the stress on your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then compare that to this. And then breathing in again. So when I slow down my breathing, you have a sense that my heart rate slows, blood pressure falls, and my state of mind becomes calm. And it's one of those things that's incredibly simple, incredibly powerful, and as it turns out, incredibly difficult. Okay. Uh, slowing down your breath a little bit is easy, but then it takes a lifetime of practice. But if you practice just a little bit every day, you'll start to make improvements. Now, I noticed something in this. In this last demonstration that you just did, you inhaled through your mouth and exhaled through your nose. In the first yes. one, it was the opposite. Yes, thank you. So uh, that, was, um, that was purely uh, so that an audience could tell what I was doing. Got it. Okay. So normally I breathe in and out through the nose. Okay. There are a few exercises where I breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. But uh, I was, um, when I demonstrate and I breathe through my nose, you can't tell whether I'm breathing in or out. And so I was just to make it clear that I was inhaling. Got it. Yeah, I was just trying to make the inhale audible. Uh, if you have a deviated septum, if you're congested, it's much better to be able to breathe freely than to struggle to breathe through the nose. Uh, so if you're able to, in and out through the nose is preferential. Um, the other thing that's interesting is if you breathe in through the nose and out through the nose, and then breathe in through the mouth, out through the mouth, you'll notice that it takes a lot longer to take a big breath through the nose. And it's That's much curious. faster with the mouth. So by breathing in and out through the nose, we slow our breathing down, which isn't a bad thing unless you are a sprinter at the Olympics, in which case you're wanting to get that oxygen in. But for most of the time, most of us uh, should be breathing in through the nose, out through the nose, slowing the breath down. Um, one of my teachers, Rama Vernon, uh, she passed away last year, but uh, she was in her mid 80s. And uh, I was talking to her one night after a conference was over and she was complaining that she was beginning to feel uh, age catching up to her. And she was at the time, she was 83 at that time. And I said, well, what's happening? And she looked at me really sad. She says, I used to be able to breathe in and out on a five minute cycle. And now I can only do four minutes. Mm -hmm. She's talking about taking four minutes to take one breath. Wow. Yeah. Four minutes. Yeah, four Amazing. minutes for one breath. Yeah. yeah, and she was complaining because she used to be able to do five. <laughs> and I can imagine that just being able to do that, yeah. even if it's four or five, she has a total calm mind throughout yes. the day. And so there's two attributes. One is the volume of the lungs. And I can assure you that I've got fairly big lungs, but her lungs are not four times larger than mine. So that's only part of the equation, getting good 
technique in breathing. The bigger component is not wasting, not burning off oxygen unnecessarily. And the two things that use oxygen more, more than anything else, nothing else even comes close, muscles and nerves. Mm. Nothing even comes close. So if your muscles are relaxed and your mind is calm, then like the free divers, if you stay underwater for, you know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and Rama Vernon doesn't do free diving, but she did learn how to slow her breath down till she was breathing in a four minute rhythm, two minute inhale, two minute exhale. But she did it by becoming so calm that her mind wasn't using oxygen or using as much. Oh, um, interesting, M muscles and nerves, because a lot of times when we are triggered by somebody or there's mm -hmm. some drama at work or you're feeling overwhelmed about certain things, that affects your nerves. It affects your nervous system. Yes, and then and the so muscles tighten up. Yeah, it's one way you know the nervous is, you know, the shoulders and everything gets tight. And then as our, uh, there's several different muscle groups that are involved in a fight flight response and abdominal recti is part of that. And so abdominal recti, the vertical muscles, the six pack uh, in the abdomen, when it tightens up, it shortens. And if it shortens, it's pulling the rib cage down and towards the pelvis. And this pulls the ribs down over the internal organs to protect the liver and the pancreas and the stomach. It, um, but it also compresses the spine. Uh, and then it also makes breathing diaphragmatically more difficult. And so, so anybody breathing, that's sitting like this, just oh, sitting up, yeah, ab, is yeah, just going to open up yeah. the rib cage and open yeah. up the diaphragm. Yeah. So um, try a little experiment. Uh, move your hips forward just two or three inches in your chair and then slump back. Good. Now breathe in, breathe out, relax, and then notice how much effort it is to breathe in again. Can you feel that? I can, and I'm not able to get a, a breath all the way in. Yeah. Yeah, so yes. now sit back up again and sit deep. And then rather than leaning back into the back of the chair, just kind of lean forward a little bit and then lift up and open the chest, broaden through the shoulders and then relax where you aren't straining. Good, and then breathe. And you'll notice that if you find really good posture, it's one way I measure um, the quality of posture is by how it affects your breathing. Now, if you try to sit up too tall, have you ever seen the kid wants to ride the roller coaster and is too yes. short and they're trying to reach that line? Okay, now sit up really, really tall. Now try to breathe. And you'll notice that you can't breathe there. So somewhere between sitting too tall and slumping is where our breath is maximized. And so what most people do, especially with screens, there's a tendency to bring your head forward towards the screen. And so if you bring your head forward a little bit, you'll feel your chest drop. Uh, imagine you're holding a, so put a book in front of you, an imaginary book, and just kind of hold that up. Ah, yes. And so yeah. hold that position for a moment, and now notice what happens to your breathing. I hold my breath. Yeah. I actually and so when we're in bad posture, what will happen is the body can't breathe in easily, so it doesn't. So then you get this breathing pattern where you breathe in, you breathe out, and then there's a pause. And then carbon dioxide's building up, building up, building up, oxygen levels falling. And finally it gets so bad that the nervous center forces you to breathe in again. <sighs> Until you take another breath and then there's a pause. Uh, if anyone has ever done hospice, uh, I haven't done hospice, but I've been with um, two dogs uh, over the years that have passed at home. And that's how uh, people and dogs breathe just before they die. Mm. You breathe in, they breathe out, then there's a pause. And then they take another breath and there's a longer pause. And then they take another breath and there's an even longer pause and then they drift away. And so a lot of people are moving on that spectrum. You look at the way they're breathing, just day to day sitting at a computer watching TV and you're going, you know, they're halfway there already, you know, in their breathing patterns. Uh, so when you improve your posture, you'll find that that doesn't happen. Um, recent study on senility, not from Alzheimer's, but from all, just general senility from all causes. And they came to the conclusion that the number one 
most common cause for senility was lack of oxygen to the brain over extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. And so then they set out feverishly trying to come up with a pill that will increase oxygenation of the brain. <laughs> and just going, really, the pill, that's your solution. Yeah. Uh, breath is so, free and it's here all yeah. the time so yeah. um, just... so when we're standing instead of slumping just lifting yeah. the chest bringing the base of the back lengthening the back of the neck expanding through the shoulders and you'll notice then whether you're thinking about breathing or not your tidal breath becomes very smooth and fluid the moment you slump your tidal breath moves into this pattern where you don't breathe and you take a breath and then you don't breathe again and so for me, that is one of the most destructive uh, rhythms and patterns. When I worked, um, I taught, set up a cardiac yoga program at Seton Hospital, and then a second one at the Austin Heart Hospital and ran them for a couple of years. And uh, when I first started working with heart patients, that was what I was seeing. That's how they were breathing. And you look at that type of breathing and it's highly uh, correlated to heart disease. Now it's not good for anything else either, uh, but heart disease, the heart especially is sensitive to breathing rhythms. So there may be a lot of people listening to this right now and having some aha moments about their breath and realizing that, wow, I hold my breath or I don't breathe all the way into my stomach. I'm just shallow breathing. Yeah. As they're noticing this, and a lot of people that watch this are very, very busy, right? Yeah. So they're going at a very fast pace. What would you recommend for the, the amount of time that are breaks that they might take during the day just to be conscious of their breathing. Is this something yeah. that they should start off like maybe once every hour for the first couple of days yeah. or once every four hours? Yeah. Well, I think the best place to start, um, you don't want to start practicing something until you're sure what you're practicing is right. In other words, if you're making mistakes, that's not the time to start practicing really hard because you just reinforce the bad pattern. So I think the first thing uh, that one should do is make sure that you're breathing well. Uh, I wish I could say find a yoga teacher and uh, you know hire them for an hour or, or even 10 minutes, just, but I can't say that because a lot of yoga teachers don't understand the breathing. Uh, however, any voice coach, anyone that teaches uh, singing or voice, is going to know how to teach diaphragmatic breathing. And if you just hire them and says, I don't care about the voice. Well, if you do, you could, but uh, can you just show me how to breathe diaphragmatically? And that's what that's at the heart of what they teach. However, you can probably do this for yourself. Okay. Um, and if you just lay down on your back and then put um, one hand on your stomach and one hand on your chest. And when you're laying on your back, your body will probably move into diaphragmatic breathing without too much trouble. And so then you, as you breathe, you want to feel your belly expand as you breathe in and your belly sinking into the floor as you breathe out. And you want to get to where the chest is not moving at all. No movement in the chest, no movement in the ribs, just the belly. And if you think about it, if you've uh, watched a baby breathe, what's moving? The belly. belly. Yeah. Can you imagine if you looked at a little baby and you saw the baby doing this? Hold on. You would think something was wrong really yeah, yeah, fast. Yeah, without any knowledge right. of anything, you right. go, that is so wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, so instinctively, intuitively, we know this. So you want to be breathing the way a baby breathes, the belly rising and falling. When you can do that laying down, then you try to do it standing, and that is a much more challenging. But if you stand with your back against the wall, uh, maybe move your feet away from the wall a little bit so you can press your back into the wall and then put your hands on your stomach. And then as you breathe in, you push your stomach out into your hands so your belly expands out from the wall. And then uh, as you're exhaling, you draw the abdomen in towards the wall. And so the wall will help uh, to find that. And then sitting is the hardest. The moment you slump, your ability to breathe diaphragmatically just plummets. The main so, thing is the, our instinct when we are startled, when we're scared, when we're stressed, um, the fight flight response. Part of that response is breathing into the chest, lifting the chest as you breathe in. And uh, sometimes you get a little discouraged um, 
I love modern medicine in many ways. In other ways, I get frustrated. And with breathing, I get more frustrated uh, with modern medicine than anything. Uh, the doctor comes with a stethoscope, and then they say, now take a deep breath. And then to model, they go, and they lift their chest like this to show you how to take a deep breath. I'm going, no, 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 that's not a deep breath. That's a shallow breath. Because they're not, they're breathing here, not all the way into the building. And so again, verification through direct personal experience. I want you to actually do this and just see what happens. I want you to breathe in normally, breathe out. And then I want you to breathe just with your chest as much as you can. Now hold it, hold that breath. Now breathe into the belly. And you notice you can't. Could you feel that? So when you breathe into your chest, you can't breathe anywhere else. And the chest, this area here is the smallest part of the lungs. The biggest part, your lungs are shaped like a pear. They're really big at the bottom and then they taper up at the top. So chest breathers are breathing into the smallest part of the lungs up into this area here. Diaphragmatic breathers are breathing down into this big part down here. So as soon as we take the breath up into the chest, we're done. We can't do anything other than breathe out again. But if I breathe into the belly, then it's quite easy to breathe into the back, into the upper back, into the sides, and then finally into the chest and shoulders. So try that a couple of times. Breathe out. If you have to put your hand on your belly, and then as you breathe in, breathe into the belly, then breathe up the back and then into the chest and then the shoulders, and then breathe out. You're so, consciously moving the breath all the way up. Yes. Mm-hmm. But you have to start at the bottom of the lungs. Once you start breathing into the top, you've lost access to the lower areas. So it's it's using your mind to mm-hmm. breathe all the way to the bottom, allowing the breath to just push itself up to come all the way up into here. Yes, all the way up to the collarbone. So that's called a complete breath or yogic breath. I don't breathe like that all the time. Most of the time I'm breathing diaphragmatically, just the belly. And then every 10, 15, 20 breaths, anytime I think about it, anytime my body decides it wants just a little bit more air, a little bit more oxygen, I take a complete breath and then I go back to diaphragmatic breathing. So when diaphragmatic breathing is your habit, then all you have to do is if you breathe in and it's not enough, you just keep breathing in. But if you're breathing into the chest and it's not enough, the only option you have is to speed up. (sighs) And so you start speeding up the breath because you're breathing into this fight flight center here. So this is your reserve parachute. You use this in a crisis. So if you're using it, your body assumes there must be a crisis. And I know that for me, I used to breathe only in my chest. That was my way of breathing until I started to learn the techniques of breath and bringing it down into my belly. So if anybody else out there is noticing that, just begin practicing the diaphragmatic breath. And question for you, do you have a YouTube channel with some videos on it? Uh, Yes, I do. Um, uh, If you just go to YouTube and Google uh, McInerney uh, and I'll pop up there, I have a channel. Uh, And then also you can get them on my website. My website's yogateacher.com. And And I've got a video link there. And they're a little bit better organized there. And I've got a seven, I think seven part series on breathing. And and it starts with basic breath. So I start with the first video. How do you spell your last name? Yes, M-A-C-I-N-E-R-N-E-Y. And I will also put the link below this as well. And I think too, we we talked a little bit about the toxic goals and the book that you wrote. I'm thinking we save that for a part two. Okay. And we go into that for part two. This has been such a wealth of information here. And I think we can just take this topic and invite people to practice their breathing, practice what we've learned here, do the title breath. Maybe if there's any questions, we could uh, address those in a follow-up and then move move forward from there. Can I share one more thing before we sure. share? Okay. Sure. So uh, the, um, my favorite way of looking at yoga, I always play a little game. Um, anything can be concretized, ritualized, and lose its originality. It becomes a ritual. And sometimes rituals are good, but sometimes the meaning gets lost. 
And so one of the games I play is I, re I realize that there must have been a first yogi. There must have been a yogi who didn't have a teacher. Someone invented yoga. And it's probably been reinvented thousands of times. And so I asked myself, what was the state of mind of the first person who wasn't looking to an external expert to teach them? And one of the things I conclusions I've come to is um, yogis learn by watching animals. That's why so many poses are named after animals mm -hmm. is that they drew their inspiration. If you've ever watched a cat wake up from a nap and stretch, how could any yogi not be Jesus. absolutely oh, mesmerized just watching that movement? And the other thing that I found is that there's a lot of things we already know how to do that yoga basically took and then tweaked a little bit. And so what I'd like to close with is um, one of the most powerful breathing techniques that we have. Okay, and I'm just going to read down a little list here um, of the benefits. This particular breathing pattern uh, releases dopamine, which everyone, well, not everyone, but most people know dopamine is incredibly important. Uh, Citicoline, serotonin, uh, gamma amino butyric acid, uh, opiate derivative peptides, and that's just what it sounds like, opium. Uh, sexual hormones, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is associated with creativity and it also opens up capillary beds and gets the fluid down into the muscles and fascia. So it helps to prevent dehydration of fascia, which is what makes us feel tight. Like we're in a straight jacket as we get older and we can't turn our head. That's the fascia becoming dehydrated. So nitric oxide helps to prevent that. Oxytocin, oxytocin is associated with feeling connected. Um, with and others love. and with the world in state of love mm -hmm. and nerve growth factor which does exactly what you think it does nerve growth factor encourages nerves to grow okay and clinical observations improved memory recall involuntary control improved introspection improved sense of timing enhances pleasure lowest stress increased salivation and increased tearing of the eyes and the students sounds amazing. Taught, I'm um, excited to yeah. learn this. And so I've taught this technique to several, well, to hundreds of students now. And two of them were on eye drops, have told me that they don't use eye drops anymore. And one of them had dry mouth and uh, she's reported she doesn't do any, her mouth isn't dry anymore. And yeah. it's just from one simple breathing technique that you already know how to do. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, just watch. It makes me want to uh, yawn. I got a little coming. And it also triggers the attention network. And the attention network is a group of decentralized nerves that collectively help us to place our attention where we choose to. So it's kind of like the um, clutch on a car. It allows you to shift gears. So the attention network of nerves allow you to disengage from one thing and then to choose what to pay attention to next. You could go back to what you were doing or you can go on. Keep yawning. That's good. I yes, I, I did that and it gave me goosebumps. It said yeah. I could see, I could feel the electrical surge through my body and it's mm. contagious. Mm. So all animals yawn. Oh, that was a nice one. <sighs> so cats, wow. dogs, that feels great. Birds, reptiles. Ooh. Um marsupials, kangaroos, all animals yawn, which tells you it must be pretty darn important just from a Darwinistic point of view. If that behavior is conserved across all species, it must be important. All animals yawn, only humans actively suppress yawning. Especially when we're in a meeting 
or doing some sort of work because we don't want to look here tired. So oh, oh. we, and there's been several times that I've done it and I've done this where I grabbed my jaw and really brought it to the roof of my mouth because yeah, yeah. I didn't want to appear yeah. tired. Yeah. And for a lot of my uh, students and patients, I do yoga therapy and um, a lot of my yoga students that come in for yoga therapy, um, I had one girl, I did a workshop on breathing and yawning was a part of it, not a big part, but was introduced to it. And uh, I heard from her about two weeks later and she said she went home, tried, tried and tried and broke down crying. And she realized that she was too inhibited to yawn at home alone. And wow. so uh, a lot of this comes back to, you know, when you were seven years old or something, you know, and you yawned in public and your mother says, yes. don't do that. That's rude. You know? So for a lot of people, the inhibitions uh, can run surprisingly deep. Some people um, take to it immediately, but the people who need it the most are going to be the ones that have the most challenge. If, if you aren't able to start yawning repetitively and easily, then that's an indication that you really, really, really need to learn how to. So there's a few techniques and this can help improve um, not just your ability to yawn on command, but also uh, make the yawning more uh, powerful, more beneficial. Okay. So the first mistake people make when they're yawning is they breathe in too much air too quickly. In other words, they get too far ahead. It's like a dog on a walk that gets out too far ahead of its owner. Uh, so as I'm breathing in, I wanna slow down the inhale, not unpleasantly slow, but I just breathe in a little slower than I might otherwise. And then as I'm getting close to the top, I start opening up the mouth. And then to pull the trigger, I tighten the throat. <sighs> so the key here and the most important aspect is the tightening of the throat, the fascia in the throat. So if you take your bottom lip down and make a grimace and you'll feel your throat tighten up. Okay, that's how you trigger the yawn, is tightening the fascia. Uh -huh. Now, if you do the same thing and then take the tip of your tongue and lift it up to the roof of your mouth, then relax, take the middle of your tongue, lift it up, relax, then take the back of the tongue and try and lift the back of the tongue up a little bit and tighten your throat. And you'll feel that the tongue is rooted down into this fascia. Uh -huh. So between the tongue and tightening the throat, you can create sensation. Now, what's interesting is yawning is an emergent phenomenon. We don't yawn from the cerebral cortex. I am now yawning continuously because yeah. it, it feels so good. And I'm watching. And that's your body trying to, your, your body realizes, <laughs> your body realizes that it has permission to yawn. And so yeah. it's trying to take advantage of that. I'm going to yawn the rest of the yawn. afternoon today. Yeah. Um, so you put that together now, you breathe in slowly, about two thirds of the way, you start opening the mouth. And then when you're ready to trigger the yawn, you tighten the throat, maybe lift the tongue a little bit. But then the key is you have to do that without thinking. Ah, <sighs> 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 uh, yeah. Ooh, that now, feels if you put good. that together with the rest of the body, float the arms out, let the arms get heavy. Wow. and then kind of expand. And then just like you were six years old, and then when you feel the next urge to breathe in, breathe in slowly. <sighs> wow, feels amazing. Yeah. And I think that's what the first yogis did a lot of, <laughs> sitting around in their cave. Wow. And then gradually they began to concretize yeah. And to look for the techniques and, and start to build the practice. But it's, it's hard. Yeah. Um, yoga should be intimately familiar. It's really not, it's not alien. Uh, we start yawning at the beginning of the second trimester. In the womb, okay. In the womb. Yeah, I've got photographs of fetuses. So it's, mouth just, open. it's a natural thing, but in our world, we suppress it. Yes, yeah. Okay. And so you'll watch a you know, five-year-old waking up without, you know, without an alarm clock and you'll see them going through the same thing a cat does or a dog does. And so, so I, I like to start my day out that way. Uh, before I even get out of bed, I like to yawn three or four times. And if you have a really spectacular yawn, do you notice your eyes getting watery? I do. Yes. Yeah. My eyes are getting very watery. 
Yeah. And so I usually yawn until I actually start crying until my eyes have watered enough that I have tears running down my cheeks. And that for me, that's okay. I'm good now. That's uh, fantastic. And of course, my salivary glands start releasing and the nitric oxide takes all of that fluid down into the fascia, into the connective tissues. And I think it's no accident that an animal wakes up, it yawns, and then it stretches. And that combination, the yawning, releasing nitric oxide, the fluid moving into the fascia, and then the movements moving the food fluid through the fascia. And the animal does that for a few minutes before it chases the gazelle. It makes sense. I, I feel so much lighter overall. I have more energy now. My yes. eyes are still watering a little bit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Really yes. incredible. So there's Thank hundreds you. and hundreds of exercises in yoga on breath, breath work, and I love them all. But if I had to choose one technique uh, to hold on to, I'd let go of everything in a heartbeat and I would just practice yawning every day. And I do that anyway. So, um, so if you, if people listening to this are taking away one thing, yeah. the yawning technique will give. It sounds like it will give you the most amount of benefit. Yes, and if you really pay attention, the next time uh, one of the best things you can do is when you um, have a yawn that comes unbidden, where you're minding your own business and out of nowhere your body starts to yawn. See if you can do the attached observation. Witness your body breathing in. Witness the yawn without interfering. And then notice what happened. And what you'll find is the yawn starts in the belly, moves up into the chest. The last little bit of air is where? The shoulders. And then as you start to breathe out, the shoulders sink, the chest sinks, the ribs. And so the yogic breath, the complete breath, breathing into the belly all the way up and down, is basically a yawn. Ah, okay. But instead of it being an emergent reflex, it's mm -hmm. a conscious control. So a yoga complete breath should be as every bit as natural and fluid as a yawn. Yes. Well, thank you so much. This has been very, very informative today. So Charles, if people would like to get a hold of you, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Your website again, and maybe any other way to get a hold of you. Uh, yes, so my website is yogateacher.com. Uh, you can Google me on YouTube, um, uh, Charles McInerney, M-A-C-I-N-E-R-N-E-Y. -E -E but uh, the website's kind of my default position. And from there, you can email me. And uh, yeah, uh, I love, uh, love hearing from people. And if anybody that's listening to this is in the Austin, Texas area, I will say that Charles teaches an amazing full moon yoga class in Austin in the park underneath the full moon. And if you subscribe to his newsletter, you'll get the dates and the times for that and the location. So I highly encourage people that are listening to subscribe to Charles's newsletter. There's a lot of great information. I think that's how we met, isn't it? The uh, full moon yoga. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so just thank you for being here. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you. I'm hoping that a lot of people learn new, unique ways to breathe and that they're going to take away some really key things to help them reduce stress, anxiety, and increase their energy and longevity. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you.